Hi, folks. Let's get started. Welcome, bienvenue, konnichiwa, and hi, Thai, as we say in Okinawa. My name is Heather Young, and I'm the very proud Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. I am also the summit's co-chair for Japan. So before I introduce this session, I would like to take a minute to thank everyone who has worked to make the summit and this session possible. I'd like to give special thanks to the organizing committee for their tireless work behind the scenes and for allowing us the privilege to present at the science summit of the 78th UN General Assembly. Also, thank you so much to my team at OIST our partners at ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, and the awesome speakers today. Thank you all for your time and energy. And thanks to all of you for joining us. You were in for a real treat with speakers from ELSI, the University of Amsterdam, and Leiden University in the Netherlands. This very, very meaningful session will consider how colonial practices are embedded in many aspects of scientific engagements, including research, policy, education, and outreach. You will hear from three experts from three regions discussing perspectives from astronomy that reflect colonial practices. And to have this conversation at the Science Summit is a privilege. The primary objective of the summit is to understand the role and contribution of science in attaining the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It builds on work from last year's summit, which witnessed over 1,600 speakers from every continent in more than 400 sessions. So the Science Summit brings together folks like you, thought leaders, scientists, technologists, innovators, policy makers, decision makers, regulators, financiers, philanthropists, journalists, and community leaders from around the world. Thank you all for being part of this conversation and this community. Thank you for sharing on the world stage. So from Tomigusuku to Tokyo, to Toronto and Tunis, from whatever time zone you're joining us, I know you will enjoy this session as it informs and inspires you. Over to you, Thalina. Thank you so much, Heather, uh, for your helping with these sessions and also last year, this year, and to welcoming everybody. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tilina Hinadiga. I'm an assistant professor at Earth Life Science Institute in Tokyo. I'm from uh, Sri Lanka, but I'm based in uh, Japan now. And uh, this topic, decolonization science, especially for astronomy, is something really close to me uh, because growing up in Sri Lanka and also working mostly with Europe and now in Japan, uh, it's a topic that I'm really passionate about, uh, mostly due to uh, my personal experience. And and I also want to introduce the two other colleagues uh, that I know for a long time uh, that joined in this, this year's uh, session. Uh, we have Pedro Russo, uh, who is an assistant professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And we have Tana Joseph, uh, who is a Dutch equity and inclusion officer, uh, who is uh, also part of the University of Amsterdam, currently in UK, I believe. And uh, so, uh, oh, Cape Town. And uh, so, yeah, in the first half an hour, each of us will take about 10 minutes and go through the different topics that uh, sort of that we are interested in. And then we have like half an hour uh, we can discuss and we are, you are happy to, uh, we are, you're welcome to put in some questions, comments, and also we can discuss uh, if you have, if you're willing to come online with your audio and video. And uh, right, so let me start. <clears throat> uh, right, but before we go further with the, uh, you know, decolonizing science, I just want to touch base quickly on uh, what is decolonization in general? What does it actually mean to uh, us in general? Or maybe it's actually some, depending on where you come from, it can mean different things as well. 
and but and also if you read read uh, about it there are many different variations meanings uh, scholars has written and but if you ask from public they also have different meanings and how it relates to it and if you ask from me i also have different way than a scholar because of uh, that I, because i grew up in sri lanka but uh, just for the, this session, we would like to go with the idea of that decolonization is an action or a process of a state withdrawing from a former colony and leaving it independent. And uh, and also uh, then restoring justice through cultures, uh, physiological and economic freedom. But these are still existing in many, not just in science, many other forms. And for example, my best friend works for one of the biggest uh, textile industries. And a lot of these clothes as you find in Euro Western countries are actually made in these uh, countries in, in South Asia. And, and it's a massive industry completely exploited and in a very colonial way. So this is not just for science and other, like many other uh, industries has, uh, has these issues. And, but here we are here just to focus on science, specifically astronomy and take some examples from astronomy. And uh, so, and in astronomy, it's really important that sort of we, we a lot of the question, uh, discussions we, have uh, can make everyone uncomfortable, and I have experienced that. And but it's really important to have these con uh, conversations because I think coming in, coming in, coming from academia, we always believe sort of way like science. Is, science is far from politics, and it's not. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, these kind of issues. But I did one of the one of the really important things that I always surprise is that science is done by people, and and people are uh, are the the subject actually created all this uh, colonization and uh, sort of different rules and regulations and, and putting people into uh, these different boxes, and and it reflects on science in in a lot of ways as well. So it is very much a political thing uh, doing science, even though we think you know there's nothing to do with that. Uh, and uh, in in terms uh, as one of the things I mentioned that I a few times that I'm from Sri Lanka, and which is the reason I men mentioned that like a topic, especially topic like astronomy, it's very global in the sense not just these, some of these telescopes are based in, you know, uh, countries where you have uh, most number of clear skies per year. But the way astronomy works is it's very global in the sense like people have to travel to countries that uh, you have the resources. And uh, a good example of this is actually Sri Lanka where we currently have about, about a dozen PhDs in astronomy or related sciences. And and they're all they're all actually outside of Sri Lanka, and it's very difficult to build anything or difficult to actually do anything when every single person who has a PhD tend to go out of the country, and uh, and even so, and then we other big issue is that when you have these large infrastructures also built in certain areas. There's a bit of a difference between what is international staff salary and what is a local salary. And now that I'm in Japan, I have experienced that myself as a foreigner. There's a big difference between uh, even in a uh, G7 country like Japan, what a foreigner would get paid and uh, or the rather what a foreigner would negotiate to get uh, paid and, and what a local would, uh, scientist would negotiate to get paid. And uh, and this is far more evident in developing countries than actually developed countries, and so access to resource, uh, financial resources is very much of varies. And uh, I think one of the examples is actually the ESO Chile uh, uh, was an example, but uh, in recent times this has been uh, addressed and actually fixed, sort of like a 
address these issues and improved it. And but many there are many other places uh, in astronomy and related uh, sciences where the local and the global salaries are quite uh, different. But there, I mean, this is not an easy issue to also solve because if you if you ask someone from a uh, like let's say Netherlands to move to a developing country, you you so you have to provide the resources that person actually needs to based in a in a in that country as well, and and then if when that person's contract runs out, you have when the person goes back to the Netherlands, you have to think about this socio economics of you know continuation of uh, their life as well. So it's a bit of a complex situation, but it's something that we all have to be aware and continuously improve through policies. And, and especially not to make, not to abandon the local uh, experts who has the uh, expertise to apply for these jobs and so on. And uh, now, other thing uh, is uh, that I would like to touch base today is actually colonization uh, outside of Earth. And I'm based at an institution that works on origin of life and origin of Earth. And uh, we are so. We are heavily uh, looking at astrobiology and all these new missions are very much of important to us. And uh, so it is very important to whenever we look into, uh, you know, colonization of, uh, and there's uh, Artemis mission on, uh, on the way and then there's more other missions coming up that will sort of aim for moon, but through Mars or uh, uh, even a space colony uh, in between. And uh, and especially space missions like Artemis is actually looking into uh, heavily uh, mining uh, and also colonizing as well. So, and one of the interesting things actually we saw uh, some years ago, uh, where some of these, uh, like for example, ESA had on their website uh, that Europeans uh, once explorers, always explorers, and it's, I think there are two sort of two ways we have to look into. One is actually uh, how to change the narratives of these uh, from explorers and discoveries and new worlds, because these are the sort of like the narratives that were used in colonial times when you know uh, the Dutch, Portuguese, and many other um, countries expanded in in their colonial uh, efforts. And but unfortunately, that mindset has sort of continued through space exploration as well, and uh, and that's sort of like a this example from ESA is a, a good way to show how that's gone into space exploration, and uh, and at the same time, the other aspect of this is that how what kind of rules and regulations to look into colonization of. Uh, uh, celestial objects outside of Earth, which is largely unexplored still. So it's always the first to be first to do this. Have, will have more authority kind of uh, approach right now, uh, and who has the most number of resources also. So these are some of the two really important things when it comes to like colonization that need to be addressed and and discussed, but not being discussed so much. And yeah, so those are the few topics I wanted to touch base. And I would like to give the uh, pass it on to Tana. No, Tana. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. And thank you to Heather and to Lena for kicking things off fast. Um, I'm going to be talking about two or three different topics um, on the decolonization of astronomy. And my first topic is the one um, that is causing and has been causing uh, quite a huge public um, outcry and um, was in the, the news over the last few years. And that is the topic of uh, where we place our astronomy instruments, our observatories. So major astronomy uh, observatories or installations are often built on indigenous land. So the one that's been in the news a lot lately is the situation in Hawaii. I'm South African, and we are building the 
square kilometer ray radio telescope, which will be when it's completed, the world's largest science experiment, um, not only in South Africa, but also in Australia. And in both those places, um, these instruments are being built on indigenous, unceded indigenous land. The same goes for Chile and the Canary Islands and, and other places as well. And so, as I said, unceded indigenous land, we're overlooking the objections and the valid critiques um, from the people who the land belongs to, local communities, and and this is causing a lot of tension. Um, it's the kind of the, the arguments for and against range from, well, you know, it was fine in the case of Hawaii. We've always had, well, we've had telescopes here for decades. Why are com people only complaining now? Um, and, and then the counter argument will be, well, in the old days, no one listened to us. So, um, so we, you know, now we have things, things like social media and so on. We uh, have an opportunity or a channel in which to voice our opinions. So it's not, um, and this is often the case when we talk about historical wrongs or the the status quo and how it got here. People will often say, but no one complained back then. Why can't I use this word? Or, you know, in my time, uh, you know, I used people from this particular subset of, uh, of this community or whatever. And they never said that, uh, you know, they never had a problem when I did this thing or said this thing. And what we need to take into account here is how the balances of power are shifting, how, you know, people weren't as empowered or were much more disenfranchised in a lot of ways um, in terms of what they could say and the repercussions they are when people are now finding their voice, not finding their voices, but now are finding ways to make their voices heard in a meaningful and effective way. And just because people, just because something used to be done doesn't mean that it can't be critiqued and revised and that we should just continue to do something the way that it always has been. And so these colonial structures, for instance, that have been going on for so long, sometimes people don't even know that that's what the origins of them are because they've been going unchecked for so long. A beautiful example of this is the South African Astronomical Observatory, where I used to work as well, also here in Cape Town where I am. And it celebrated its 200th birthday a couple of years ago. And it is, the SAO is South Africa's oldest research institution, but it was started by the British as a, um, as an aid for their navigation, um, so that their ships could, you know, so that they had accurate maps of the stars and the sky, and so that their ships could, um, navigate the bottom part or the, the south of the African continent and, uh, further their colonial activities all around the world. And so now it's that, you know, South Africa's oldest research institution is 200 years old, 200 years of astronomy in South Africa, but the origins of it, um, are very, very different and a lot more sinister. So there's a very urgent need to, you know, acknowledge these issues, call them what they are and redress, um, the problems that have, um, ar ar arisen due to this. And so now we're at this really important juncture where we have this opportunity to, listen to people, to work with people and to empower um to empower the people who are the um uh, the original keepers of the land resources and other resources, other natural resources that we're using or disrupting um or trying to, you know, infiltrate. And it's there's some progress and there's still some difficulties, but it's been a very interesting um uh, journey so far and we seem to be moving in the right direction. Um, the next one. Next slide. Thanks. So education and public engagement. I do a lot of work in both these, um, sectors for astronomy. And what you see is that the astronomy education and public engagement is still very much from a largely Western view of astronomy and science. This image you can see in the sepia tone is an image that's taken from a astronomy textbook or science textbook for kids, um, school kids, and it's something that's used in the Southern Hemisphere. And it shows you the Northern Horizon, it shows you the North Star Polaris, it shows you the Big Dipper constellation. And the thing about that is that where I am in Cape Town right now at minus 34 latitude, you can't see any of those constellations. So the education that we are giving young people is not, um, it doesn't gel with their lived reality. 
So you're showing people science or trying to introduce science to young people and get them interested um, and get them engaged. And what they see in the textbook has nothing to do with what they see in their love life. And that is not the way to go about engaging people. And so um, also, for instance, the constellations, the names of the constellations, they're all ancient Greek constellations or uh, from ancient Rome, etc. Uh, we are not teaching our kids the constellations in the languages that they love in, in the languages that they learn in. Um, and it's not because there isn't a lack of, there isn't a lack of these names. Um, indigenous people from the, um, Australian Aborigine and Torres Strait Island people, various, um, various Indigenous people from the Americas, from Africa, etc., all over the world and across Asia have their own very intimate knowledge of the sky, using skies as, uh, you know, as calendars, as timekeeping devices, as navigational aids, the same as Europeans have, but we only learn a specific subset of names. And that's another way to disengage people um, and make them think, you know, this kind of science isn't for them. And so easy and obvious steps to take would be to go over our textbooks and make sure that they reflect the love reality of the children that we're trying to teach. Next one. So then the science community, uh, Jonathan Mark, who is a, was a professor in, um, in life sciences, I think he's from the US, he has a three strand definition of what science is. So science is a series of techniques, he says. So, you know, when people think of science, they often think it's collecting facts. So they, that's a part of it, collecting facts, collecting data. Um, then science is a community of people, the science community who does the science, because science is a human construct. And then it is a, an organizational, an organizational hierarchy in conversation with power. And to me, when you have people and you have hierarchies and you have uh, power structures, you have what Selena so beautifully laid out for us already that you have politics. And so, yeah, I'll be talking about the science community, but now when I talk about the science community, there's a lot of politics involved as well. And the people who do science um, are expected to put a certain profile in terms of the, who they are in their identities as a person. And so science, academia, and astronomy, absolutely as well, it's still largely based on the 17th century European social structures where the people who can do science are usually people who come from money, who don't have family responsibilities, family caring responsibilities, et cetera. Um, there's a feeling in, the, in Western science, which comprises most of what we think of when we think of science, um, that religion has no place in science. People with disabilities are very much excluded as they are in the rest of society. People who don't come from money, people who come from um, underprivileged socioeconomic backgrounds, and there's a lot of evidence to back this up. That one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest factors that contribute to whether someone will stay in science academia is whether they are, um, at, at the very least, comfortably middle class. The more money you have, the easier it is to stay in science and do a, a career in science. And so all of this is to say that the system of academia, how we set it up, is not broken. We often talk about a broken system when it comes to why aren't there more women in science? We often talk about this construct called a leaky pipeline, which implies that, you know, the pipeline is broken. It's not working as efficiently as it should. But I'm here to tell you today that the system is not broken. It was absolutely built this way. This is a feature, not a bug, as they say in um, in computer science circles. So this issues that we have about diversity and about who, you know, who can do science or who ends up doing science, who ends up being allowed to do science, um, where the money goes, um, who gets to do what kind of science, that is all uh, based on the fact that we have a system that is no longer fit for purpose and is very much built on, uh, built up from a culture that came about in the 17th century when colonization really started to kick off as well. And it's not surprising, therefore, that we see these parallels um, within astronomy, within science academia, and within these structures um, that currently uh, make the world go round. Thank you, Tana. Yeah. yeah. Pedro? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chilin, and thank you, Tana, for starting this reflection. And maybe I'd like to start by, by saying that, of course, I come from a, a place of privilege. 
uh, I, I'm a, a white European man. I've been educated in some of the former colonial colonial powers, including Portugal, Germany, and the Netherlands. And, and this discussion and some of the work and some of the, the, the discussions that I've been having for a long time with Helena and also for quite some time now with Tana, they've been helping me to reflect a bit about the, the, the role of the colonial structures within the formal structures of science and especially in astronomy. And it's, it's one of the fields that I've been trying to explore and been touching. And this is really just, you know, in a way, some of these reflections from this conversation. Uh, I will, I think, build a bit on the discussions that we had. Uh, one of them is about this, this idea of the knowledge and where knowledge belongs and what is knowledge, what is the artifact of knowledge. And one thing that we, we reflected is about even the way that we build the narrative around the scientific enterprise, in this case, astronomy enterprise, is also a lot about the way that we write and perceive the history of science in the different places. And if we look at the, the ethnographic museums that we have all, all around Europe, we, we can see a lot of, of artifacts coming from all around the world. These former colonies, uh, some of them sh showing these exotic lands, these eccentric uh, people. And it's a way also to tell such a narrative. When you look at the science museums, and especially science museums outside Europe or the Western world, we see that the science museums reflect a lot on the knowledge that was produced from Europe. If you go to a science museum in Brazil, you'll see the instruments and the scientific instruments that have been developed, done, and used by Europeans, either in Brazil or in South America or in the global South. So I think we, they, and they, they in a way, they build a colonial view on the knowledge production and the knowledge that is used then to understand the world. And I think this is a, just another example that when we look at the construction of knowledge and the construction of narratives about knowledge, we have been using a lot of this imagery and the, the artifacts from the Western world. Next slide. Another one that connects very much with the two points that both Dilin and Tanen mentioned, one of them is about brain drain, and another one is about construction of new facilities. And in astronomy, due to the limitations that we have in, in, in access to the night sky, a clear night sky, this is something really important, the location of our observatories. But if we look at this kind of workflow, almost pipeline of colonial resource exploitation, it was very much focused on the idea that there was resources in countries that could be, or in nations, or in land that could be colonized. These resources were then transported, sometimes with terrible, uh, in terrible ways, like enslaved people, and then they will bring added value on the lands that the colonial powers could really create these added values. Now, if we think about the current observatories that we have in the global south and also in, in indigenous lands, next slide, Lina, like in South America or even in Hawaii or even in Chile, we also see that the most of this location of these amazing facilities that we have been building are in the global south. But what we can see is that the data that then we got from these places or using these places is then transported to the global north, transformed, and in a way brings added value by the communities, especially research communities in the big global north. Of course, it's, it's a big step comparison this, but I think there's something here to, to reflect a bit on the way that we use some of the land, some of the resources, some of the partnerships that we have with local countries. But I think we need to reflect also where this added value brings. And when I look, I look at the added value, I mean about cultural value, uh, social value, scientific value, but also economical value. And I think it's good for us to also reflect a bit on that. Next slide, Tilina. Another aspect that we have been, there's been a lot of discussions uh, all around the, the world, especially also in Europe, United States, about investment funds from the research, especially universities, but also uh, uh, research institutes. Most of the universities in Europe, they do have investment funds. There was a big discussion about uh, removing investments from uh, funds connected with uh, oil, with fuel, with fossil um, fuel. But there's also a big discussion that we still need to have or is still happening about the investments that we have in funds that they are connected with enslaved people or slavery funds. And this is still an ongoing discussion. And also, also we cannot forget that in a way, 
we are benefiting economically and financially in our research organizations, including our universities, from these investments that we did for many decades, many, many decades, on money that came from enslaved uh, enslaved money. So I think we still need to look deeper into this question and trying to understand how our colonial past is still contributing to generate wealth within the research systems and, and of course, astronomy, the astronomy enterprise. Next, next slide. One point that uh, I think is also also interesting to reflect that connects quite a lot with the colonial colonial uh, practices because we cannot forget the colonial practices. Usually, they were very violent uh, practices, very much connected with the, with military interventions. And still today, fields like astronomy and space exploration they still have a very strong connection with the military and defense industry. There's a big discussion at the moment about the connections between fundamental research, applied research, and defense. Actually, uh, the very famous astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson wrote a book together with Avis Lang about these alliances between astrophysics and the military. But it's quite interesting that even in the, uh, an agency like the European Space Agency that has in the mission uh, a very strong statement about the exclusive peaceful purposes of space exploration, Every day they sign contracts with multi-million euros contracts with companies that develop military uses, so that they are not only for peaceful purposes. So this is something that I think we need to reflect. That sometimes we look at astronomy or space sciences as like this almost uh, uh, exploration of the universe for exclusive peaceful purposes, but we have strong links with the defense industry. So that I think is also a bit another point that it's good to reflect on. And I think Tilina, that's the next slide. I think now is the time for discussion. Yes. Um, thanks, Tana and Pedro. So, and I think we we very briefly each of us discuss very large topics that each actually deserves like much larger discussion. But the whole idea of also try to uh, do the do these sessions at the UN Science Summit is to sort of keep developing, and hopefully next year we'll have ideally uh, within a couple of days to expand each topics. Uh, and and those who are interested in these topics uh, can also join the, some of the discussions and or lead the discussions. And uh, anyway, so next half an hour is uh, for us to discuss couple of issues and so on. And if you have questions or comments, please use the chat box and you can uh, send in your uh, questions and comments and or raise your hand and we can also uh, bring in you uh, to ask your question. And uh, to start with, actually, uh, someone in the uh, audience, Jakob, Jakob Van Loon, asked a question from Tana, which is really, which is a question I'm very interested in. Uh, let me read the question out. Uh, uh, Jakob was asking, do you have advice how to reform academia? And uh, maybe um, Tana and Pedro uh, can pitch in, but one of the things I, I would love to see is actually open access. Uh, and, and the reason is, so, you know, my, so I had a lot of colleagues in Sri Lanka at the, some of our national universities there, so to pay for a journal subscription, it would cost more than a salary of a professor. And it's that expensive for a developing country to get access to these journals. And so sometimes like I have two uh, astronaut groups uh, in there, very small, but a lot of the times I have to download the papers and actually share because that's the only way, there's no other way to access these papers. And I think reforming academia also one way is to look at it as uh, is open access, and which you know general publication has become such a business, and to the point it's really hard to even suggest certain changes, but I think that would make a huge difference in many countries to make open access uh, data publications. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things I'm really interested in uh, reforming academia. Uh, Pedro, uh, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, you know, Tana, I think Tana will have a bit more than me because she has been thinking about this for the last for the last months, maybe years, about the the way that the, in academia we can, especially in astronomy, especially in astronomy in the Netherlands, we can change a bit the the way that we work. And I think a lot of it, it what Tana mentioned, is very very important. This idea that we have the structures in place and they are not really they were built like this, so we need to, in a way, rebuild them. Or so that's I think is important point. I think building a bit on what you were saying, Tilin, about open open access. I think we need, you know, we, the open science movement. I think is also good support that it's not only about access to existing knowledge. It's also access to data. It's access to the methodologies. It's access to the the, the software that will be enabling our colleagues from the from the global south to have access to this already existing. Um, body of tools, knowledge, and data that can also build on that. That will be very, very supportive. And I think that's an important an important aspect that we need to, we need to have. And uh, so I'll, I'll let Tana comment a bit more. Um, yeah, thanks again, Jakob, for the question. I typed something in the chat there. Um, as I said, there are a lot of resources on this topic, and there are many people working on it. So I will say two things. I'll say what I said in, um, in the chat and something else as well. Um, maybe three, three things, three things. One is that the first thing we need to do to borrow from um, the language of addiction um, and recovery is that we need to acknowledge that there is a problem. And so we have these, um, you know, these forums like we have now. Pedro and I have given this a, a version of the talk, the original version of the talk at a symposium that was for a bunch of academics. We were the only people from the sciences. Uh, we're now speaking at, you know, the UN um, General Assembly, Science Summit, um, et cetera, et cetera. But what there isn't at the moment is a general acknowledgement that there is a problem. Uh, we need, and in particular from the people at the top, and then the question becomes, how do we get the people who benefit the most from the status quo to dismantle the status quo? It's something I don't know how to do. I don't know how to answer. I'm genuinely asking. But we need to acknowledge that there is a problem. You can't fix something if people are telling you, which they are, that everything is fine. Why would you want to change it? And this is especially a problem in places where um, astronomy or science um, as it's practiced right now, has a very long history um, and has, you know, um, is very, not just entrenched, but has a very storied and long history. It's a big part of, say, a nation's identity or, uh, you know, something like that. And then they're like, but this is working so great. Why, why are you trying to, you know, upend um, this perfect system that works and has worked for centuries? So that's, that's the one thing. How do we get buying from senior management and there's evidence to show again coming from corporate because in academia we don't have that um for various reasons we don't have that well, those kind of studies done but say from corporate there's evidence to show that when you want to do cultural changes or equity diversity and inclusion work or social justice work or psychological safety or whatever you want to call it in the workplace one of the key indicators about whether the program will succeed or not is whether there is meaningful buy-in from senior management. So that's one. The other thing is, I would preach, and this is for the sciences, especially the hard sciences, the physical sciences, um, which includes astronomy, absolutely. I would preach humility. Just because we know how to work with photons, and just because we are often seen as super geniuses, if you, a lot of us have this experience, if you tell someone, oh, I'm a scientist, or oh, I'm an astronomer, the first reaction is, oh my God, you must be so clever. And that might be true, um, but it doesn't mean you know everything about everything. So I would teach humility to know what the limits of your knowledge and expertise are and to reach out to people who have the knowledge and expertise to be able to do this. We've been thinking about decolonization for centuries, for decades, um, before we you know, had an inkling that maybe in STEM we have a problem. So I'm talking about the humanities, the social scientists, the arts reach over to them and this is something again that a lot of scientists don't feel comfortable doing or are very dismissive of but have the humility to know where your what your sphere of influence is and what your knowledge base is and reach out to people who do have um, the expertise in this who have been thinking about it for a long time who've been working on this for a long time and it's a a lot of you you know there was a time at universities when it was very cool and hot aka you could, you could get a lot of funding for saying you're doing 
multidisciplinary work or interdisciplinary work. And this is a perfect example of that. How can we, from the sciences, work with the social sciences and, huma and the humanities to bring about a change, a meaningful change in academia, whether it's decolonization, where it's, um, or, you know, uh, better, better teaching practices, etc. And then the third thing I will say to finish this is we need evidence-based intervention, which is a weird thing to have to say to science scientists, especially hard sciences, especially the physical sciences, where everyone thinks, you know, scientists are just data, you know, data robots. We're just fact collecting robots and we don't have biases because we're really good at math. And so somehow that means that you can't have internal biases about how the world works. And it's exactly the opposite. A lot of what we do when it comes to trying to, again, do the social justice equity, diversity, and inclusion, psychological safety, decolonization work is surface level work that looks good. Because if you go and give a talk at a girls' school, you take a picture with the girls at the end of the talk, you put it on your organization's website, and you tick it off for the hashtag women and, girl, women and girls in STEM day or whatever it is that happens in February. I'm very busy on that day. I do like five, six talks on that day every year. Um, but we don't know what the lasting impact of this is. We're not doing evaluation. We're not following... Um, the evidence that often comes out of, you know, the social sciences on what things do we actually have to do to change, to make meaningful and sustainable change and make progress in the way that we want to make progress. What does this progress look like? How long will it take? All that kind of stuff. We're just doing surface level good optics work. We need evidence-based intervention. And the data is out there. The evidence is out there about what works, but it's not glamorous. It's not cute. It's, um, it's, a bunch of numbers, and you again, you'd think scientists would be okay with doing, you know, what the evidence tells you, even if it's not cool or doesn't look as flashy. But um, it's something that uh, I have found is very difficult to uh, to get people to engage with because they want the easy fixes, they want the quick fixes. So those, yeah, so those are the three things. Thanks, Tana. Uh, I'm going to go to another question that uh, Boris uh, submitted. Uh, I will read it out so everyone online and also can uh, those who are uh, watching this later can also uh, listen in. Uh, Boris asked, could you talk about how Western science through colonialism has impacted how knowledge systems are prioritized? and how you believe that makes its way into our educational and outreach practices, uh, moving beyond the content we present. Uh, does Pedro or Tana, do you have any? Pedro, you can grab this one. I, I think I'm trying to, 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 to fully understand the question, but uh, you know, if I, if I, I, I think if I understand, I think we, we need to reflect that most of the, the, the current knowledge system that we have in place, the, the one that we know that we teach at universities, we teach at the primary education, secondary education, has been built with this vision of the Western perspective of science. So, and that's been the priority. And even when we, colleagues from, and I'm, I'm using a lot of the term global south, but maybe even from former, former colonies, they, they still use these materials because they were available. So I think there's a, a very lack of bit of lack of reflection and about the these these practices and and we have been prioritizing this knowledge and i think it, we didn't have or we are we are now starting to question some of this knowledge and trying to understand how other knowledge systems how other type of knowledge valid knowledge could also be part of our better understanding of the world so i think i'll i'll like just to, to to leave it like that so but for sure we have been prioritizing a western perspective of the knowledge for decades if not centuries yeah, if I could also add, uh, since I, my education of uh, my uh, school education is from Sri Lanka, everything we learn in, in science is ba basically Western science. There's, even though we have so much of uh, science that was done in, in Asian countries or especially in Arab, and none of these actually make it to the textbooks. So everything you learn, and the other fascinating thing I found is that culturally we have a, such a strong connection with like the Earth Moon system, because most of these 
uh, especially South Asia, a lot of us uh, back then, a lot of things were based on agriculture and agriculture was based on the earth moon system and how the stars are moving and you know the harvesting, the timing, everything. And, and this was such a good knowledge that doesn't really exist anymore in textbooks or, or it disappeared since the colonization. And uh, and we, we we are learning them, but in a very Western perspective still today. So like pretty much my education, my father's education, and even my, um, like my nieces and nephews education in Sri Lanka is still for love, like 50, uh, it's been 70 years since uh, we, uh, we got the freedom. Uh, but we are still learning very much of Western uh, curriculum. Uh, I think that's uh, one of the hard, difficult things in a country like the education reform is really hard and to bring in these local perspectives into and something that especially us, we need to work on uh, locally as well. I think that's, that's just to add more, uh, Decolonizing astronomy and science actually goes both ways. Where it's it's not something just the why like Western global north should work on, but it has to also something that global south and developing countries need to work on as well. Like it has to be from both sides or multi sides. Um, can I go to another question? Uh, yeah, uh, Danilo asked. What could be the mechanisms used to assure that astronomical research and technologies are exclusively related to peaceful purposes? Um, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, maybe, maybe I can start with some, some of the pointers. And uh, this is a very, very interesting question. Of course, this, this, there's a big discussion in the ethical community for ethical ethics of science and technology about unintended use of research, right? We, we never know when, because if we look at open science, we make our knowledge useful for others, but also to other fields. And people can also use that knowledge for other purposes that sometimes when we are developing or creating this new knowledge, we don't know what's going to be the, the last use. The unintended use. So that's something that we cannot fully control. We can have the ethics and we can have e ethics compliance. And if we look, for example, at, um, at the working with companies, we can also look at the ethics and compliance of the ethics of these companies related with environmental issues, legal issues, and maybe also military use. You know, where every time there's a public proc procurement for a certain type of construction development of uh, thousands of euros, the co companies need to comply. We need to make sure that they pay taxes, they pay social security, but we can also have systems to make sure that they their investments are not in slavery money, that they, they are not uh, damaging the environment, and maybe they're also not damaging other nations. So we can have in place systems to make sure that the, the, the companies that we work with are compliant with the ethical requirements that we as a field can demand. Yeah. I would also say um that of course a lot of this um a lot of the mechanisms uh legislature uh decision making happens at a level above where scientists sit as well. So we um as a science community need to be more perhaps vocal in our political activity where we lobby our politicians and the people who ultimately make these decisions, because as we said, um science is political. Um, where our money comes from, it's often decided by governments that, you know, they make strategic decisions about how they're going to fund certain sciences. But in return, we can also, you know, use our collective voice to make sure that the people who are, you know, the lobbyists, the legislators, the policymakers, et cetera, are aware um, of our feelings on this um, as a community and how we'd like to move forward. So, um, again, it's starting from the first principle of acknowledging there's a problem, letting people know that there's a problem, or, you know, as a community, we have decided, like, these are some guiding principles that we would like you to incorporate, um, and so it does also require us as the science community to be um, active advocates and loud advocates uh, for change at the highest levels as well. 
Yeah, one more thing I would like to add is that uh, it's also interesting way to look at um, some of the large large scale research infrastructures are based, you know, in in countries that the funding actually comes from the global north or like very wealthy countries, and and oftentimes most of these poly like you know local agreements has you know we will give this much of jobs locally this much of you know community engagement and so on and but also interesting to see like how much of local scientists get get published or become at least co-authors of published papers in these uh, research infrastructures and because a lot of the large uh, institutions the first authors are based in global north or very wealthy countries and and that's one of the interesting things actually to look at you know how much of credit or how much of access the local scientist has uh, to these infrastructures um, maybe we can go to one more question uh, which I, I saw uh, Pedro already answered a few things on the chat uh, let me read out. Ariana is asking, do you have some examples of good practices or cases that have already been put in practice in order to decolonize astronomy? Uh, I actually have, so recent, uh, the IEU, if Tana and Pedro is okay with me going first on this, uh, okay. Recently, uh, so the IAU has a regional meet, has a couple of regional meetings, and the the regional meeting for Asia and Pacific was held in Japan uh, in August. And uh, I met the uh, couple of people from the TMT, uh, the thirty meter telescope uh, team, uh, who was uh, visiting. And uh, one of the things, actually, good things they said, you know, T TMT has been an issue for the longest time and still ongoing. And I think one good practice that we, there's been a lot of discussion, but finally implemented is that there's a new, new sort of like a new team in place. And, and there are a few people who are local and from indigenous communities join the TMT team, uh, community engagement team. And this is especially the community engagement team. So I think that's a one good way to go about where that you are engaged with the community, local community, but also through the leaders are the local community members as well. And, and that's a good way to sort of engage these large infrastructures with local engagement. But on the other hand, I think a lot of the times these, so this is a good practice, but as what I have seen is in many, big infrastructures when we say, oh, we should actually do something, uh, these, these infrastructures should uh, engage locally. And a lot of the times that means, you know, doing outreach or local engagement, community activities. But at the same time, it's very important. I, I feel like it's very important that we sort of work on changing the perspective of, of the top management because as long as the top management has the same view of doing science and same way, way of you know doing running activities, it, no matter how much local activities you run internally and the mechanism won't change and you will be engaged locally, but then it's very important to bring that connector back to the top level as well. And which uh, is still lacking in many of the infrastructures. Um, if Tana Pedro, if you have anything to add, please. I mean, I, I added a, a few examples a bit more more specific. I think okay. Tilina, I think you you touch some important points, but I know that the SKA, the telescope, they with the Share Sky exhibition, I think there was a, an, an attempt, and I think it's it's uh, sometimes we don't know. And there's a question about best practices. I think there's a complexity of solutions that we need all to apply all of them at small scale, large scale. Uh, long-term change, but I, I think an, an initiative like the Share Sky that was uh, giving visibility to 
cosmologies from the First Nations or the, the initial nations of the land where this facility is going to be built, I think it's a good attempt to, to bring to the forefront the, the indigenous, some of the indigenous knowledge that we have about astronomy and the night sky. So that's just an example, a very, very specific example. Okay. Um, we do have a question uh, asking, Morris is asking uh, if you have any resources you'd like to recommend how to best carry out evidence-based interventions. Um, yes, sorry, I was trying to, I was trying to actually Google this as, as we were chatting. So, um, I don't know, is our slide deck going to be available? Because there's, there's links to, um, uh, reference, the links to the references are in the slide deck. So if we can make that available somehow, they're clickable links, um, that's where to start. Um, there are resources out there. Um, they often, I find them in, just like this, in the slide decks of, for instance, talks that I've attended at conferences, um, and you could possibly find them online. They, I would say that you should look out, this, this is how I've been kind of going about this, is look out for equity, diversity, and inclusion, or equality, equality diversity, and inclusion conferences uh, for sciences or for academia in your local area or in your country. Um, and a lot of what we call EDI work, the equity, diversity, and inclusion work now is starting to include decolonization. Um, what I will say about decolonization work and evidence-based uh, work is that it's very specific to your local context. Each place has its own issues that it's grappling with in a unique way or own issues that exist. Um, and so it's, um, so, yeah, so it's very important that you understand the general frameworks that we're talking about, but that you need to look at your local context, whether that's at a national level, a continental level, a, a departmental level, um, your sphere of influence, and what that, how these frameworks will be, be applicable to your, um, to your local context, because there's no one size fits all, um, solution. I'm sorry, I'm not giving, giving you, you know, specific pointers, but um, there is a body of work on this and it is very region specific and, and yeah, place specific. So, um, yeah, if you're in the UK, I can point you to some res uh, resources if you're in South Africa, maybe. Um, and I don't have off the top of my head a lot of resources for, for instance, Asia Pacific, uh, but maybe Talina has. Um, there's a lot of work uh, that's being done in the US. Um, I would say in general, yeah, the U.S. is uh, further ahead, for instance, than Europe when it comes to grappling with these issues uh, for various reasons. And so that's one of the problems that we have in a way its own colonized kind of view of how we're doing decolonization work. A lot of our work and our evidence also comes from the U.S. and is not necessarily applicable wholesale um, in Europe or in Asia or uh, certainly in Africa or even, um, you know, when I, yeah, um, or even in South America, even though, you know, things are happening in the Americas. So we need to be mindful of that as well. Um, and it's not the kind of thing that we as scientists are trained in, which is why we need to work with, um, with our counterparts in the humanities and the social sciences. So maybe that's an easier place to start. Contact some, um, look up if you're at the university or look up where you're in your local university on the, you know, on their webpage, go and see who's working on this kind of work and send them an email and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Can you help me? Or does your science faculty have a, as they have at Leiden, um, Pedro works in the department of what is it, science for society? Is that right, Pedro? Yeah, yeah, look up in your local institution, whether you're at a university or not, your local universities, and see, have a Google, see if there are people who are already working on this in your local area, and shoot them an email and say that you want, you know, you want to chat about this. Selena, yeah. bef before we close, I know that it's already time, but I, I'd like to reflect a bit on the on the question from Enrico Gomez. I don't know if it, that's still possible. I don't know if you want to. Sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, and the, I think the question is about the, the indigenous lawyer systems that they don't have the shared the same ontology and ep epistemic framework of academic communities. 
if stars and mountains were built, observatories are regarded as person, how could this be integrated in, in practice of research? I think this is a question that we see a lot, and I think it's one of the central questions sometimes about the discussion and sometimes about this tension between whatever we call it Western knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems. But I think we have to reflect, and Tana might uh, add a few things here, that the indigenous knowledge systems, do they follow a very close system close to the Western science? They follow the scientific method. You know, they are based on observations. They are based on creating hypotheses. They are based on observations a few months later, a few years later, and they do predict the same way that the, not in Western science does behaviors, phenomena, and events. So in a way, indigenous lawyer systems follow exactly the same methodology that we have in Western science. The big difference is sometimes they were not recorded in the ways that we define as the definition for science peer review publications, journals, access to this. But the, the knowledge that exists is scientific knowledge. I think that's one of the first reflections that we need to have about the indigenous knowledge systems. Sometimes it's only at the publication stage that it's not Western knowledge. The second one is about the construction of telescopes in sacred mountains, and in Hawaii is a very example. I don't even need to compare if in Europe we'll say that we have to destroy uh, a cathedral to build radio telescopes the uproar that we'll have in these communities, right? This will not happen in a city saying, we're going to destroy this cathedral to build a radio telescope. That will be also part of the same discussion that we see now. But it will be the same in a natural park. Natural park have specific requirements that you cannot build something there because it's being defined as something that we want to protect. So I think the these type of connections is not so much about indigenous people. It's about how we recognize the autonomy, freedom, and the uh, and uh, of these indigenous communities, and I think that's something that we need to reflect. I don't think they are that far off from what we do in the Western world. Thank you, Professor. I think uh, I have to sort of close now, and uh, maybe uh, each of us can add some very very short final comment. And then I have some uh, uh, updates that I would like to share with everyone. Uh, maybe we can go start with Tana. If you have one. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just want to thank again everyone for their, um, for their time, for joining us here, uh, for the excellent questions. Um, and I hope that you, if not, that you know, that you, if you haven't found answers, at least it's sparked some questions. and. Um, my homework for you, um, if I may be so bold, is to please take these conversations, these thoughts, these questions into your uh, local research communities and start um, start having them. I think that's yeah. I think that's going to be where this um, where these kind of conversations are very powerful if we have them often and openly in our local context. Thank you, Tana, uh, Pedro. No, I, I guess, you know, that what we did here is a bit of a reflection of uh, observation and some, some looking at the previous work done by many, many scholars and also academics and activists on this field. And I think what, what I would say, I think it's really up to all of us in the that work in science, that work in astronomy, that work in, in policy, to really reflect and to make sure that we educate ourselves. This is not something that is impossible to do. I think we just need to educate ourselves and there's enough literature, there's enough work done by many decades of previous uh, thinkers on the topic. And I think we 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 owe that to them. Thank you. And uh, I would like to add uh, that this is a conversation that should have happened a long time ago. And if it did, my life would have been much easier. And so many of us would have been in a, I, I, I had uh, much more resources and access growing up. But, uh, but it's a conversation recently started and I would sort of beg everyone, really encourage everyone to keep going. And a lot of, lot of these, it's, it might be hard to find like evidences and practices that are already in place because not, not so much is practiced right now, but it should be. But one of the best things we could do is to discuss and 
ask questions, a lot of questions and make it, make awareness. Because every time you bring this topic up, that would help somebody out there at some point. So please continue the discussion. It's really, really important. And I hope to, uh, that all of you will join next year. And next year, we hope to make it a bit longer. So if you are, if this is a topic that you are actively engaged and would like to uh, contribute in some way, or you wanna give a talk or join a discussion, please write to me. And, uh, and then we will have access to this uh, video uh, through the platform soon. Uh, and later it will go on YouTube, but it will take a couple of weeks to get into YouTube. And uh, and also in the meantime, uh, if you can go to the same web page and provide some feedback for the summit, uh, Science Summit program, I would really appreciate it. Uh, so with that, I would like to close. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for joining from wherever you are. I appreciate uh, spending time with us and asking all these questions and comments and being engaged. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Chilina. Thank you, Tana. Bye, everyone.